Over the last several episodes, we've learned to shape the path by tweaking the environment and building habits. In today's episode, we will use a technology that combines the two, the humble checklist. How can something as simple as a checklist be so powerful in changing behavior? Take a look at the writing of Atul Gawande. In an article in The New Yorker, Gawande wrote about the health implications of line infections, that is, infections from intravenous lines that are put in to deliver medication. Dr. Peter Pronovost of Johns Hopkins compiled a five-step checklist to prevent such infections. The steps were straightforward. They included having the doctors wash hands before inserting the line and cleaning the patient's skin with antiseptic at the point of insertion. But the results were surprising. After 18 months using the checklist, Michigan ICUs nearly eliminated line infections, saving 1,500 lives. Why are checklists like this so effective? They educate people about the correct behavior. They direct the rider. But even when there is no one right way to do something, checklists are still effective. Cisco Systems uses a checklist to analyze acquisitions. It contains questions like, will key engineers be willing to relocate? And will we be able to sell additional services to the acquiree's customers? These checklists ensure against overconfidence. In one study on overconfidence, people were asked to come up with solutions for a university's parking problem. The average individual brainstormer came up with 30% of the best solutions, but these brainstormers predicted that they had come up with 75%. Think of how a checklist could have helped. It could have provided solution categories to consider, like solutions that raise the cost of parking, or solutions that help more cars park in the same amount of space. Like Cisco's checklist, this could have generated a greater number of ideas. So why do people so rarely use checklists? It could be because they find them dehumanizing. They associate them with the checklist used by fast food chains to ensure you get the same hamburger as everybody else while relying on unskilled labor. But 747 pilots and surgeons use checklists too, and they save lives as a result. Checklists also help you avoid the fundamental attribution error. Dr. Pronovos could have concluded that the line infections were a result of sloppily negligent doctors. But instead he asked, how do I change the situation so that doctors are more likely to avoid line infections? How might a software development team use checklists? I can think of a few places. In code review, you can have a checklist to confirm that all formatting, architecture, best practices, security, performance, testability, monitoring and alerting, and usability concerns have been addressed before code is committed. In retrospectives, we have a form of checklist in the five steps to a retrospective. Set the stage, gather data, generate insights, decide what to do, and close the retrospective. In operations, we have run lists and standard operating procedures that provide a form of checklist to reduce the chance of human error in processes that are difficult to automate or have not yet been automated. A continuous integration and continuous delivery system is a checklist that has been automated. What other checklist can you think of? We've now seen how to shape the path by tweaking the environment, building supportive habits, preloading decisions with action triggers, and using checklists. In the next episodes, we will examine the final piece of the puzzle, the influence of other people. We're going to learn how to rally the herd. If you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you can subscribe for free. On LinkedIn, click the follow button next to my name. On IGTV, you can just click the person icon with the plus next to it.